In today's video, we're going to explore some of the more useful and elegant extension methods you can add to your Unity projects. Little pieces of code that make your everyday workflow faster, cleaner, and more expressive. We're going to start with some simple extension methods and work our way up to more advanced patterns, turning conditions into awaitable tasks and even awaiting Unity events directly. So there's lots to cover today. Let's get right into it. Okay, well, let's start with something simple. If you're new to extension methods, an extension method lets us add new functionality to an existing type without modifying the original class. We define them in a static class, and the method itself must also be static. The key part is using the this keyword before the first parameter. It tells C-sharp which type we're extending. So here we're going to extend the float type and add a method called remap. In game dev, we often need to take a value in one range and scale it to another, like converting player input from 0 to 1 to a movement speed between 10 and 100, or mapping a health bar percentage into a UI bar length. Without having a helper, we'd end up writing little bits of math all over our code, so this is a perfect job for an extension method. Now you may have seen this done before, and maybe the math looked something like this. Here we're taking the original value and then normalizing it to the first range, and then we multiply it by the size of the target range, and finally we add the from to to shift it into place. Now, this is pretty manual and it has some problems. First of all, it doesn't clamp values, and secondly, there's no protection here from division by zero. Unity already provides two methods that can solve this problem elegantly. Inverse lerp maps a value from a range to a zero to one space. Regular lerp maps from 0 to 1 to a target range. We can combine these two to make our revap cleaner, more readable, and more robust. In fact, we might as well turn this into a one-liner. Now, we we'll probably won't demo every single extension method we're going to build today, but it might be useful to see this one in action. Let's suppose that for some reason you have a cube in your game and you want to map the mouse X position to a Y position in world space. You could use our new extension method to remap that value from an amount that ranges between zero and the screen width into our Y range of min height and max height. Then you just apply it to the cube's position. And as we move the mouse left and right, the cube should slide smoothly up and down. Let's hit play. Start moving the mouse back and forth. You can see it's being mapped between zero and five. Next, we're gonna build a helper for copying data between arrays. Let's start with a static method called block copy for any array of type T. Our method is going to copy a certain number of elements from the source array at a specific offset into the destination array at a certain offset. A naive approach is to make a loop over the number of elements you want to copy and just copy them from the source into the destination. Now this is actual code that I saw in a production system this week, and it's not wrong per se, but there's no safety here. If the offsets or counts are wrong, we'll get out of range exceptions, and if either array is null, that's also a problem. A better approach would be to use the array copy method, which is a built-in .NET method optimized for this exact operation. Then beyond that, you could encapsulate any sort of safety measures you want right here inside the extension method. Now, putting that to use is really straightforward. If we just wanted to copy some of the data into the buffer starting at index 3, we just call our extension method like so. But this can still be improved. We might want to make sure that we don't have any numbers that fall out of range, so you would add multiple checks here. Now it's starting to look a little bit better, but let's consider one alternative. I'm going to come up to the top here and add one more extension method, but this time I'm going to make it explicitly for the type span. Not only are spans value types, but they have some excellent built-in functionality. We can slice both spans down to the relevant sections, and then we can call copy2. This slicing operation is allocation-free, and copy2 handles the optimized memory move internally. We can still perform some range checks, but spans can never be null because they're value types. So how would we use something like this? Well, let's go back to the example. Here, let's add some arrays similar to what we had above. But here we can just use the as span method from the array type and call block copy from there. Now our two extension methods are basically doing the same thing. So technically we could come back to our array version and then we just convert our array to a span and use the other extension method. Doing this removes some complexity. We don't have to do any range checks anymore. And using spans is just as fast or often faster than using array copy. So for us, that means that back in the example code, instead of using as span here in our calls, we can just call block copy directly. All the logic is encapsulated within the extension method. Let's debug a few things out to the console and go have a look. So of course, there's not much to test here. We just want to verify that the correct values come out in the console. Looks good. 
Let's move on. Unity already has wait until for coroutines, but we can build an extension method that will bring that same wait until some condition is true functionality into an async workflow. Maybe you're loading a scene and you want to wait until the boss is loaded before you show the UI. Notice that here we're going to extend a func of type bool. This means that we can call this method on any condition function. And I've set the default polling interval to be 33. 1000 millis divided by 30 FPS equals 33.33. .33. So we'll evaluate the func roughly every frame. We'll make a static helper method for this. It's just a small asynchronous loop. While the condition is false, we delay for the given interval and check again. The call to configure await false tells the runtime not to capture the current synchronization context. This avoids unnecessary context switches, especially when running outside of the Unity main thread. So back in the main method, let's start with a couple guard clauses. If the condition delegate is null, we throw immediately. There's no point in continuing. And if the poll interval is zero or negative, that would spin endlessly without yielding, so we enforce a positive value. Then let's use our helper to run a background task that will continually check the condition until it becomes true. Once that's finished, let's handle the simple case first. If no timeout was provided, we just wait until the condition succeeds. We await the wait loop directly, and once it completes, we return true to signal success. If a timeout value is given, we set up a separate delay task that completes after that many milliseconds. Task when any waits until either the wait loop or the timeout finishes. If the first one finishes the wait loop, we return true. But if the timeout finishes first, the method returns false. This is a clean, non-blocking way to express wait until this happens, but not forever. So what would this look like in practice? Well, we could define a func where we want our progress to be greater than or equal to one. In update, we can increment that float by half of delta time. And just to show that we're not blocking the main thread, let's also rotate the transform of this cube. In start, we can await the condition using wait until with a timeout of say seven seconds. As soon as it's finished, let's log something to the console. We're debugging the time since level load, so it should be about two seconds, and there we see it there. So that works great if you're using task, but why don't we take a look at how you might do this for an awaitable. Notice here that we're returning an awaitable, and this time I'm not going to include a timeout. Let's have the same guard clauses we had when we were dealing with tasks, but this time we're going to create an awaitable completion source. This gives us a handle we can complete later when the condition finally becomes true. Before starting any loop, let's check to see if the condition is already true. If it is, there's no need for any polling. We just mark the source as complete and immediately return its awaitable. If we make it past this, let's convert the polling interval into a time span for readability, and we can define our polling loop as a local async function called poll. Here we'll continually check the condition, and while it's false, it waits asynchronously using a waitable wait for seconds async. Once the condition finally returns true, we complete the source, which will in turn complete our awaitable. Finally, we start the polling loop and immediately return the awaitable. This means the caller can await it right away, the polling happens in the background without blocking the main thread. So how would that look in our example code? Well, we could just await the condition using wait until, set a poll interval. You can see if I hover over, it's returning an awaitable. And then we could just log something out to the console. Now, the signature of these two wait until methods is almost identical. If you happen to have both of these in your project, you can be more explicit about it. Instead of using it as an extension method, you could simply call the static method directly. Of course, you also can't assign an awaitable into a variable the same way we can with a task, since awaitable isn't a standard .NET type. It doesn't expose properties like result or methods like continue with. It's meant purely for use inside an await expression. Okay, so what we've done there is overcome the limitation where we can't await a delegate. We can clearly see this code is not going to compile. Now, by the same token, if I was to introduce a button, well, we also can't await on click. On click, if I hover over, returns a button clicked event, which inherits from Unity event. So why don't we give a little bit of thought to how we can await a Unity event? Normally, Unity events like button.onClick are callback based. You'd have to register a listener, handle the event later, and remember to remove it when you're done. Now that works, but it breaks up the flow of your code sometimes, especially when you just want to wait for something one time and then continue. So let's start by extending Unity event with a method that returns a task. We can start with a guard clause to make sure the Unity event is not null. Then we can create a task completion source. This acts like a manually controlled promise. We'll complete it when the event fires. 
Now, here's where the magic happens. We can declare a Unity Action Delegate named Handler. Inside it, we first remove itself from the event. That makes it a one-shot listener. Then we call try set result true to complete the task. We're going to assign null first because we need to reference handler inside its own definition. Declaring it ahead of time lets the compiler know the variable exists before the Lambda captures it, so we can safely remove the listener from within itself when it fires. Finally, we can attach the handler to the event and return the unfinished task. When the event fires, the handler runs, the task completes, and any await on this method resumes. Now, another thing to think about is that Unity events can return a specific type. So we can make a generic version of this that is almost identical. The only differences are we're going to have a task completion source of type T, and we need to set our Unity action of type T's handler to null. Everything else about this method is exactly the same. So what kind of magic does this allow us to do in our example? Well, if I just backspace a few times, we can add the as task extension method here, and let's log something out to the console. So here, I better add a button really quick so that we have something to use. Just come here under UI, let's grab a Text Mesh Pro button. I'm not going to do anything to it. I'm just going to select my cube where I have the example script, drag in the reference, let's hit play. So now we are awaiting the first call there that we created towards the start of the video, but now we can await the button click. Let's click it. There we go, we see the message in the console. So that was fairly straightforward, but it might also be useful to see how this could be implemented as awaitable. So it should come as no surprise, this is going to be very straightforward. Instead of returning task, we return awaitable. Let's have the same guard clause. Instead of using a task completion source, we're going to use an awaitable completion source. Then we just have the same logic as before. We create a handler for the Unity action. Then we can define the handler in exactly the same way. Add that handler as a listener to the event and return the completion source as an awaitable. And the generic version of the awaitable version is going to be pretty much the same. Same guard clause. Here we need an awaitable completion source of type T. We need to define the unity action type T handler. Then we add it as a listener and again return the awaitable completion source as an awaitable. Now, if we come back to the example script, let's just change as task to as awaitable and go try it out in Unity. Let's just jump right into play mode. Nothing's really changed, of course. We just wait for the first event. Now we can click and all done. Notice that I can't click anymore. No matter how many times I click, nothing's going to happen because we're not waiting for anything anymore and there's no listeners registered. So, of course, this applies to more than just button clicks. You can use that for any Unity event that you just want to await. Now, I'm going to add a few more tricks into the repository, so feel free to go and check those out. I might only add awaitable or task versions. I haven't quite decided yet. But regardless, that's all I've got time for today. So don't forget to hit the bell. There's a lot more advanced and intermediate Unity type topics coming this fall every Sunday morning. And of course, join us on Discord if you feel so inclined. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.